On June 25th, 2021, Derek Chauvin, the Minneapolis police officer convicted of murder for the death of George Floyd back in 2020, was sentenced to 270 months or 22 and a half years of prison time. This was an aggravated sentence from the top level, which would normally impose a 180-month sentence for a similarly situated defendant following the presumptive sentencing guidelines. Judge Peter Cahill found four factors to aggravate the crime, although he only used two of them. I've gone through his sentencing memo so that you don't have to and extracted the uh, useful information out of it. Let's talk about why he got to his 22 and a half year sentence, according to the judge himself. I'm Nick Ricada of Ricada Law, a small law firm in central Minnesota. I'm a lawyer. I'm also a legal and political commentator on YouTube and on Odyssey. Wherever you're watching, go ahead, hit subscribe, hit like, turn on your notifications. Make sure you're not going to miss any future videos. All right. We've got uh, a bunch of points that I've highlighted out of the memo. The memo is 22 pages. Peter Cahill is the judge. He wanted to very much make sure to clarify and solidify his reasoning for the sentencing guidelines uh, or for his departure from the sentencing guidelines in both directions. Now, he addresses at first, and this is where we're going to start, why he did not involve, uh, why he did not impose a downward dispositional departure from the guidelines. I'm going to talk about what all this means in just a second. But after that uh, initial part, he goes into the factors considered for the uh, for the increased sentence that he decided to impose. Now, guideline dispositional departures. What does all this mean? Let me explain it very, very quickly. Oh, and by the way, I watched this live and that live stream is still up on the channel. It is a couple hours long because, you know, uh, it was a sentencing hearing, so it took some time, but you can find it linked right up here and probably at the end of this video as well, uh, along with a playlist of Derek Chauvin, George Floyd videos, and you can find uh, all of my sort of discussions of the case and where they where it's gone during a, during its lifetime. So that being said, Let's jump into first talking about what the sentencing guidelines and dispositional departures and all that means. All right. So in Minnesota, when you are convicted of a crime, there is a sentencing grid. The X axis, right, is your criminal history score. It goes from zero to six. You get points based on felonies and misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors that you may have committed, depending on the severity of the crime. And then the Y axis is the severity of the criminal offense. This is a second degree unintentional homicide, which is the second box down on the Y axis. And Derek Chauvin has a criminal history score of zero, which puts him in the first box. All right. And that's where we're going to start uh, when we talk about this. That first box would have a presumptive sentence of 128 to 180 months. The judge would be restrained to following those guidelines unless they can justify a departure upwards or downwards from that guideline. And those justifications are laid out in uh, the sentencing guideline memorandum provided by uh, the Sentencing Guideline Commission. They give you some factors to justify and articulate those justifications um, to grant those departures. If a judge departs from the sentencing guidelines and does not justify that departure adequately, uh, that can be appealed and the guideline sentence can be imposed. So, Judges want to make sure and very particularly and thoroughly describe their justifications. And that's what's going on here. Now, Chauvin had requested a downward dispositional departure uh, that would have him serve 12 months of probation, which would be no jail time. And that's where we start off on his side. The state uh, conversely requested a doubling of the presumptive maximum sentence of 180 months, which would be 360 months or 30 years. What we got again was 22 and a half years. 
270 months. Uh, Peter Cahill sort of split the baby on this one, and we're going to discuss why. All right. For a defendant like Mr. Chauvin with zero criminal history points, the guidelines presumptive range for unintentional second degree murder, the most serious charge with which uh, Mr. Chauvin was found guilty by the jury and on which he is being convicted and sentenced by this court is 128 to 180 months, with the presumptive sentence being 150 months. Consideration involves a two stage process. <laughs> In the first stage, either a jury or the district court must make factual finding that there are one or more aggravating factors present in the commission of the crime apart from the prima facie elements of the charged crime. So they have to go through and prove out these aggravated factors. We're going to talk about which four they were. Uh, I also did a video on this when it came out, but we're going to talk about them briefly here. If you want a more detailed description, check out that other video. It'll be in the playlist. In the second stage, the district court is required to explain why the presence of any such aggravating factors creates a substantial and compelling reason to impose a sentence outside the presumptive guidelines range. That's what I talked about a little bit ago. Let's get a little deeper into this. Okay. This court found that the evidence at trial proved beyond a reasonable doubt the following four aggravated sentencing factors. So with these four sentencing factors, one of the things that, uh, that Cahill is going to get to here is that you've got four aggravating factors and basically no mitigating factors uh, that they're going to consider here. So therefore, he's not going to go down. He's not going to go down on this one. All right, so the factors are Mr. Chauvin abused a position of trust and authority. Mr. Chauvin treated George Floyd with particular cruelty. Children were present during the commission of the offense. And that Mr. Chauvin committed the crime as a group with the active participation of three other individuals, former Minneapolis police officers Tu Tao, Thomas Lane, Alexander King, and all who all actively participated with Mr. Chauvin in the crime in various ways. Now, personally, I have issues with basically all of these aggravating factors being applied. Again, I did a whole video on this and you should check it out there. That being said, um, we're going to discuss how he applied each of these factors through the course of the video. All right. So the dispositional and durational departures requested by Mr. Chauvin are not appropriate. He says, Mr. Chauvin seeks a probationary sentence, a dispositional departure from the presumptive prison sentence under the sentencing guideline, or alternatively, a downward durational departure from the presumptive guideline range for a prison sentence. This court concludes neither is appropriate in this case. Uh, he, he says there has been no persuasive showing that Mr. Chauvin is particularly amenable to probation. So this is the idea that a client has some particular amenability to probation. And they say that has not actually been shown in the court case. They haven't had a finding of it. And he's not persuaded by, uh, by Eric Nelson's memorandum on this one. And so that's, that's one, one of the mitigating factors, that you have to be particularly amenable to a probation sentence. And he's also combining that with a probationary sentence would be disproportionate and understate the severity of Mr. Chauvin's offense. So those are the two major factors here. He doesn't really have a lot of mitigating uh, circumstances. He does have four aggravating circumstances according to the court. And so therefore, you're just not going to get a dispositional departure when that is the case. So that's um, that's where we found this. Uh, now we're getting we're going to get into those four factors. And there's some interesting stuff here. Let's go back up to them. Here are the four factors. Again, abusing a position of trust and authority, treating Floyd with particular cruelty, children present and uh, active participation from three or more other offenders. Now. Again, I've given my opinion on all of these. I don't think any of them technically uh, fall within the spirit, with the spirit of the sentencing guidelines. Um, however, however, they do fall within the wording of the guidelines uh, according to how the court has reasoned through them. Now, Peter Cahill uses the first two, but I find it interesting that he does not use the second two factors. 
And that is kind of comporting with the idea that it, while the letter of the sentencing guidelines may be followed here, the actual reasoning behind them and how the courts have applied it is not in play. So I'm not going to actually focus on the top two. Let me summarize them real quick, but then we're going to go. I like to grab, I grabbed a couple parts out of uh, Cahill's rationale for the second two, because I found it more interesting why he wasn't using those factors. Why he's using the trust and authority factor is because Chauvin's a police officer. Chauvin is a police officer with the Minneapolis police, and therefore he is in a position of authority. I think we could argue about whether or not he was in a position of trust. And my personal distinction with this one, I don't believe that George Floyd entrusted himself or submitted himself to the authority of Derek Chauvin. Chauvin was not the original arresting officer. He comes on the scene. Floyd barely has any interaction with him before he is on the ground. I don't see him placing his personal safety in Chauvin's hands. I don't see that actually occurring, but that is, and, and that's where I draw the distinction. It's uh, to me, it doesn't look like Chauvin particularly abused his police authority any more than any other police officer abused their authority. Now, if I go with the court's finding that he did murder George Floyd, that's not a particular abuse of authority. He didn't exploit his authority as a police officer to affect the murder. At least in my opinion. So I don't, th those two don't match up for me. Just because he's a police officer who happened to commit a murder, I think that the specific circumstances of this case don't actually support that aggravating factor. Uh, but that's, again, that's my opinion. And I'm just trying to tell you why I thought a little differently. Now, the next one is uh, that he treated George Floyd with particular cruelty. And what the main thing is, let's be real on this one. There's a video of George F Floyd being kneeled on by Derek Chauvin for nine minutes while he dies. That video is uncomfortable for people to watch. It was uncomfortable for the judge and the jury to watch. Um, they had to endure it several times. It's been uncomfortable for people to watch on the internet. In fact, if you show it on YouTube, they will likely age restrict the video and put a big giant warning on it that it's graphic content. So uh, the video is really what did Derek Chauvin in on this thing because it takes the out of context while well, this was nine minutes and puts it into an actual nine minute ordeal. And that is the type of stuff that, uh, that really gets to juries. So that being said, um, I don't see this as when I think of particular cruelty, I think of having a design to be cruel. I don't know that Chauvin unin could I don't know how you commit an unintentional homicide with particular cruelty. That's a thing that is troubling to me conceptually. It, it, it's a weird idea, right? Well, he didn't try to kill him, but he did kill him in a particularly cruel way. I don't really buy that. But again, it's why I personally don't think that this is a proper aggravating factor uh, because it basically says that Chauvin, by kneeling on Floyd in the way he did, is in the same category as someone who walks up and like uses a, a, a sharp implement to start hacking someone up and like smiles and cackles while they do it. To me, that invokes the particular cruelty thing or someone who like, you know, I, I, I again, I, I, I don't want to get too descriptive on like what cruelty and violence looks like in my head. It doesn't look like this. And an unintentional homicide, I think to me that that just poses a a problem for a finding of particular cruelty. But that said, Peter Cahill disagrees. He uses those top two factors. He does not use the second two factors and that's what we're going to go uh into right now. Um, we're jumping down to page 16 of this memorandum. And 
Uh, here we go. The presence of children at the scene during commission of the offense is not being used as a substantial and compelling reason for an upward durational departure under the circumstances of this case. And I think this is this is definitely the right call. This one is a particularly bad use of the aggravating factor if he were to use it. It says, this case is very different from other cases involving children in which the courts have found substantial and compelling reasons to depart upward. Okay, so the long and short of this is that there were three 17-year-old girls and one 9-year-old girl who walked in upon the scene where Derek Chauvin was kneeling on George Floyd. And so under the letter of the rule, yes, there are children present during the commission of this felony offense. However... However, this is really about utilizing children in a particular way or intentionally inflicting pain upon the children through the commission of a felony. Think about a spouse battering another spouse in front of the child to punish the child or to punish the spouse so that they know that their kid is watching this sort of egregious act. That's kind of the idea you get from the presence of children. Um, something that would traumatize and cause particular damage to the children. And you could say that they're traumatized by watching the death of George Floyd, but I mean, so is everybody who watches the video under that analysis, and I don't think that that is particularly fair, and neither did Peter Cahill. He says... Uh, he says in here in summary that there's no evidence, there's no showing that these girls were particularly traumatized by what they saw uh, on the street that day. And in fact, you know, the girl who took the video is one of the 17 year old girls. Uh, she's got a media manager and all of that stuff. And that probably doesn't help the idea that she's uh, that she's been traumatized, that she's now got a management agent to uh, to promote her her social media gold mine or, or whatever. It just kind of rings hollow, right? That's not what this guideline was about. So in other words, while the presence of children is an aggravated sentencing factor and a permissible ground for departure for purposes of the first stage analysis, under the second stage of the analysis, the court does not find that specific facts in this case are so substantial and compelling to warrant an upward durational departure on this ground. And in the footnote here, uh, he, he indicates those cases typically involve children being present indoor homes or daycare centers when a parent was the victim of a violent felony. And that's that's the thing, right? They've got some emotional uh, investment into a victim and are particularly traumatized by this event because of that existing relationship because of the thing that would that would particularly traumatize a child none of that's present here i agree with mr cahill uh that this should not have been used I, of course i'm going to because i don't i don't think there should have been any aggravating factors in this case again that's my opinion you're free to disagree mr chauvin's actions as one of a group of four minneapolis police officers actively participating in the restraint of george floyd is not being used as a substantial and compelling reason for an upward durational departure under the particular circumstances of this case. This is because uh, the, the statute, the statute for this um, actually says the offender committed the crime as part of a group of three or more persons who all actively participated in the crime, but the sentencing guidelines are similar but narrower the offender committed the crime as part of a group of three or more offenders who all actively participated in the crime. So this requires a showing of more than uh, three other people actively participating in some way. I mean, if you think about it, right? Think about it like this. If you've got a bank heist, you're one guy and you go in to rob a bank and you go up to three different tellers, right? Uh, or a teller has to pull in two managers to get authorization to unlock the drawer. You, you, you send a note that says, I've got a bomb. This bank's going to blow up if you don't give me the money in the drawer. They get two tellers to give money and a manager to come in and unlock the drawers so they can just hand over the cash. Well, now you have three other persons actively participating in the criminal act, right? You've got two bank tellers and one bank manager saying uh, they're, they're getting, they're opening drawers, they're handing over the money, all of that stuff. That doesn't really make sense. Instead, the guidelines go with offenders. They have to be purposefully availing themselves of the offense. They have to be 
uh, participating in a, in a way that is contributing to the offense, and that has to be their intention. There's some intentionality here, and there was no showing of that in this case so far. As Peter says, although this court found the three other officers were actively involved in this incident, the court made no findings that officers Lane, King, and Tao had the requisite knowledge and intent to be considered offenders. That is not to say there must be a conviction before three other persons could be offenders, only that it was not proven during the trial that Lane, King, and Tao could be labeled as such. And there are some serious doubts as to whether they'll be convicted as accessories to this crime because they asked, they asked Chauvin, hey, there's no pulse, maybe we should roll him over, maybe we should change positions, and he turned that down. That doesn't hold up to the intentionality aspect of the participation that we would want to see in a dispositional departure. Finally, the appropriate prison sentence is 270 months. He says, uh, I, I wanted to point out that the existence of a single aggravating factor is sufficient to justify the imposition of a sentence of double the upper limit of the presumptive range. That's enough. All you need is one. All you need is one to do it, but that doesn't mean that it automatically happens. And he goes into an analysis of how he comes to it, uh, and he uses some data on here that basically says, on average, 67% of the people are going to be within the presumptive guidelines for the similarly situated defendant with a criminal history score of zero. And then uh, there have been 20% of people get an upward di disposition, 13% get a downward disposition. But only two cases uh, had an upward disposition that were higher, and that was really, really awful crimes um, involving abuse of three-year-old children in both of them, also involving guilty pleas. So... On to the conclusion. Part of the mission of the MPD is to give the citizens voice and respect. Here, Mr. Chauvin, rather than pursuing the mission, treated Floyd without respect and denied him the dignity owed to all human beings and which he certainly would have extended to a friend or neighbor. In the court's view, 270 months, which amounts to an additional 10 years over the presumptive 150-month sentence, is the appropriate sentence. So there is the justification from Peter Cahill on the 22 and a half months Again, he found a particular cruelty based on the time that was spent for the death of George Floyd while he was begging for his life. And then uh, the first part was, uh, or the first one is because of his position as a Minneapolis police officer, as a position of trust and authority. And it's important to note that that, that one typically doesn't involve police officers either. I'll link the entire opinion if you want to read it for yourself. Uh, down in the description below, but he almost had to walk that first one back. I think he should have walked all four of them back. I do not think they should have been considered as aggravating factors. Again, that's just my opinion, uh, but I don't know. What do you guys think? Drop a comment down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Until next time, thanks for watching. Hope you found this educational and informative on this process and the reasoning behind it. And if you did, Share it so someone else can see what's going on. All right, guys, have a nice day. Peace. Peace.